Welcome to the Alcohol-Free Lifestyle Podcast, where you learn to live a life of health, wealth, love, and happiness. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Victoria English, head coach at Alcohol-Free Lifestyle. In today's episode, we're going to talk about high-functioning problem drinking. This is going to be part one of two. Let's start with what is a high functioning alcoholic? When we think of an alcoholic, what image comes to mind for you? When I was stuck in the cycle of drinking, an alcohol high function, an alcoholic woman, an alcoholic mom conjured up images of someone who was not taking care of her children, someone who was not feeding them healthy food, getting them to school on time, taking them to extracurricular activities. Perhaps she was passed out at the dinner table. The kids' clothes didn't fit. They were dirty. I didn't match that image. I was a mom of four. I was working, teaching Pilates, a role model of health and wellness. I was room mom. My kids were involved in lots of different activities. And I made dinner just about every night. That cognitive dissonance of the idea I had in my mind of what an alcoholic mother would look like in my reality, my truth, cost me years. Years that I could have been healing, improving my life. Except I had created this image and until my life matched with that, I figured I was okay. I now realize that that was untrue and I'm grateful that I did stop before those, that image became my reality. So in today's episode, I'm going to ask some tough questions. It's an invitation to break through some of your limiting thoughts and beliefs so that perhaps you can seek empowerment and a solution to this issue. First off, I'd like to address the term alcoholic, high functioning alcoholic. You know, when I was drinking, I used to kind of joke about it. Yep, I'm a high functioning alcoholic, ha ha. Except inside that made me feel terrible, but I had to lighten it up, right? Add some levity to my increasingly distressing situation. So, What term is used today is alcohol use disorder. If I had known back then about this term, alcohol use disorder, maybe I would have gotten help sooner. Alcohol use disorder is a treatable condition and it is a broad spectrum, mild, moderate, severe. If you are listening to this podcast, it's possible that you are somewhere on that spectrum. People who consider themselves high functioning problem drinkers can can have a problem. You know, on one hand, we know something's wrong and yet we're not meeting all of the criteria used to diagnose alcohol use disorder. One of the criteria is uh, it includes an inability to control drinking even after suffering some consequences. They may not be the big ugly ones that we think of. Or maybe some of those have started to creep in. The issue with people who are high functioning is that we have a lot of things to prop us up prop up our claim that we're fine. 
High functioning problem drinkers tend to be educated, employed, functioning members of society, perhaps even big contributors in their community. During this episode, I'm referencing studies from the National Institute on Alcohol and Al Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And one study on AUD, Alcohol Use Disorder, has estimated that about 20% of people who meet the diagnose, diagnostic criteria for an alcohol use disorder appear to others to be highly functioning. Other research estimates that as much as 50 to 75% of those with AUD are able to function at a high level in many areas of your life. If that resonates, keep listening. So what are some behaviors of high functioning problem drinkers? Take a deep breath as you listen to this list. And again, this comes from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. As I go through this, maybe make a mental note or put some checks on a piece of paper. By any of these that describe you. I know this is tough, except we can't initiate change and breakthrough and empowerment unless we're first able to look at this. I invite you to step back and look at this through the lens of science, of psychology. Doesn't mean you have to be a scientist or a psychologist. But if you can remove some of the emotion and some of the defense, the instant defense mechanisms that may want to kick in, I think you'll learn a lot about yourself, about alcohol use disorder, and most importantly, what we can do about it. All right, here we go. Behaviors that may indicate that someone has high functioning alcoholism. Number one, avoiding any critical input or feedback about your drinking patterns. If someone mentions your drinking, how do you respond? How do you react? Do you point fingers at someone else who drinks more than you? Do you make a list of all the things that you're doing well? Number two, blacking out from alcohol consumption. In a recent P90, Project 90 group coaching call, we explored the hippocampus and how, alcohol, how it is affected by alcohol. With repeated use, the hippocampus can be damaged, leading to blackouts or brownouts, grayouts, where you kind of know what, what you did, but you don't remember the details. Number three, concealing how much alcohol you're consuming, such as drinking before or after an event. In an effort to drink responsibly, while you're in front of other people. Have you done that? I did. A little pre-gaming, show up, have one or two, so I could look like a, a normal drinker. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if I didn't get to pre-game, I would go home and drink some more. So you may be at an event where alcohol isn't served or you told the people you're with that you wouldn't drink. And so you may sneak a drink. You may take some in your bag. You may make a, a walkabout through the event and grab a drink from the bartender when you think no one is looking. 
This may also include drinking by yourself. It could also include hiding alcohol around the house. Number four, continuing to drink even if it has caused or worsened physical or mental health problems. Alcohol is tricky. It's very insidious. And so we may not recognize the toll it's taking on us day by day. But if we look back a few years ago, maybe, and we look at where our mental and physical health were, do you see a decline? Maybe you're still exercising. That's very common amongst people with high functioning alcohol use disorder. They're still working out. Are you making gains? Are you making strides in your physical health? How about your mental health? Are you finding that you feel low quite a bit? Are you finding that the only time you can feel balanced or perhaps a little bit of happy is when you're drinking? Alcohol is a depressant and it has a tremendous impact on our neurotransmitters, the feel-good ones, dopamine, serotonin, and it releases more of the ones that counteract and increase stress, that counteract the effects of alcohol in an effort to return to homeostasis, such as cortisol, adrenaline, creating that anxiety. Number five, Denial of a drinking problem because of a lack of severe consequences. This is a big one in amongst high achievers, certainly one that uh, each member I've worked with has expressed. It usually sounds something like this. Well, it's not like I don't go to work. It's not like I don't go to my kids' activities. It's not like I'm falling down all the time. It's not like, it's not like, it's not like. Are you avoiding the truth there? It's okay. I get it. Number six, I think I'm on number six now. Going back to what I described earlier, not fitting a predetermined image of an alcoholic, such as being able to maintain a well-groomed appearance. You know, in hindsight, I ask myself, where did I create that image of what an alcoholic mother looks like? I'm not completely sure, but I think certainly seeing women who were really, really struggling with the kids that looked the way I described, women who couldn't hold a job, women who had their children taken away. I didn't look like that. And so I felt justified. So ask yourself, where did you learn what this looks like? Where did you learn what that image of an alcoholic is in your mind? And is it true? Number seven, drinking a large amount of alcohol and appearing and not appearing intoxicated. Oof, this is a big one. That's called functional tolerance. And no, it's not because you're Irish or German or Scandinavian, although that is a component and I'll get to that in a moment. Functional tolerance is your ability to ingest large amounts and still function. 
So when I described a brownout, you know, I would wake up the next morning and the dishwasher had been emptied, lunches had been packed, kitchen had been cleaned up. I had washed my face. I was in pajamas. And I could remember glimpses of it. I couldn't recall all of the details. And my kids knew me well enough to know if I'd been drinking, but often I would interact with people and have full-on conversations. That's functional tolerance. Now, I am of German and Irish descent, and I used to joke about that. I was built to drink. Well, to some extent, that may be true. People of uh, European descent tend to have more uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. That's an enzyme that helps convert alcohol, helps metabolize it. Uh, so, yeah, other people uh, of say, perhaps Asian descent, they have, they actually have to work to develop an alcohol problem because they flush, they have um, a response that makes them feel uncomfortable when they ingest alcohol, like a histamine response. And sometimes we've had members uh, who have said, who've told me they've taken an antihistamine before drinking so that they could get their buzz. So it can happen, but yeah, if you're of that uh, ancestry, you may have more alcohol dehydrogenase, making it easy for you to metabolize and like alcohol and fall into that cycle. The thing is your liver, your body, your brain, it's trying to deal with all that alcohol. And so my liver was stressed. My brain was completely out of whack. Functional tolerance. Another one, drinking at lunchtime. I don't know if culturally it's as common to drink at lunchtime as it used to be, say back in the Mad Men era, we've all seen that. But in truth, is drinking at lunchtime good for you? <clears throat> or is it possible that you are feeding the craving, right? We wake up in the morning, we feel lousy, not gonna drink today. Around lunchtime or maybe a little later for you, three o'clock or so, it's coming on strong. Your brain is crying out for it. And so if you're like me, you're not swigging out of some flask. You're sitting at a sophisticated restaurant having a classy cocktail or a classy drink, two drinks, three drinks to take the edge off that craving. Next one. I admit I've kind of lost count now. <laughs> Drinking in situations that can be dangerous, such as before driving, that's an obvious one. There's not a person here that when they are not drinking would say, yeah, I like drinking and driving. But many of us did it or you're doing it. That's the effect of the alcohol, your prefrontal cortex, your ra rational part of your brain, your reasoning part of your brain is compromised. And so suddenly it seems like an all right idea. You would never do that in your right mind, but we do things like that. Also, when you think about it, if you're taking care of others, is it a good idea to be compromised at all? No. What if there's an emergency? Are you equipped to care for your child, your aging parent? Would you be safe driving them to urgent care or the ER, heaven forbid? No. And so in your right mind, you wouldn't do that. Drinking as a reward for doing a good job or to cope with stress. Now these are two big ones. Our Project 90 community is made up of high achieving, high performing individuals. Their jobs are no joke. They, they deal with a lot. They are the problem solvers, the trailblazers. They're the ones taking care of things and creating. And that's not easy. And they have learned that they deserve it. 
They're telling themselves they deserve it. I've done such a good job. Look at everything I dealt with today. Look at the amount of stress I'm under. And you may remind people around you about that, that you deserve to drink. Does your family deserve that? Hmm. I know, hard to hear. Drinking excessively when not abstaining, but not indulging regularly. Or you rationalize it because you can go for long periods without drinking at all. Okay, this is one I tried. <laughs> all right, so I use the budget. I would not, let's say it's Sunday and I wake up after a night of drinking and I'm swearing it off. And I say, okay, that's it. I didn't drink, Mon I'm not going to drink Monday. I'm on a roll. I'm not going to drink Tuesday because I'm committed. On Wednesday, it gets a little bit harder. I'm starting to pile up some reasons why I might deserve something later in the week. Thursday comes and I'm holding out. Friday comes and what, what would I do? I would usually drink a week's worth of alcohol. See where I'm going with this? Now, I used to be able to do that for weeks, sometimes months at a time. As I continued down the path of alcohol use disorder, those weeks felt really long. <laughs> and sometimes I didn't make it to Friday anymore. Maybe I'd make it to Thursday and say, wow, I've done such a good job. I've worked out every day. Look at all this meal prep I did. I have crushed it, and Thursday seems like a good time to just dip my toe in the water, have a couple, and then really go for it on Friday. Eek! I get it. Cravings. Do you have a strong urge to drink? Do you feel like, I need a drink? People without an alcohol issue don't experience those things. People without a drinking issue don't dwell on alcohol every day, every other day. It's kind of like cookies. I don't dwell on cookies. I don't think about them every day. I don't wonder when can I have a cookie because I didn't have an addiction to cookies. Alcohol is a drug. It is designed to create these things. Feeling guilty or ashamed about being intoxicated or about the behaviors displayed while under the influence of alcohol. Now, again, this is one that might invite comparison. Well, I mean, did you see that guy at the, at the company Christmas party? I mean, he should really do something about it. Yes, there are going to be people who are worse off than you. They may be further down the spectrum of, Al of AUD. Except how do you feel about you? If you take away all the comparison, how do you feel? Do you feel proud of how you behave when you're under the influence of alcohol? Or is there some guilt or shame? I actually coached a call in Project 90 today about the neurobiology of shame, what it does to our brain and how it can keep us more vulnerable to returning to drinking. So it's something we acknowledge and we use ultimately for empowerment. Feeling an overwhelming urge to finish drinks, even if they are someone else's. Oh boy, do you relate to this? I do. I remember uh, back in Miami when I lived there, we went to a lot of galas and things like that. 
And the pain I would experience when I would finish my glass of wine while I was waiting for the waiter to circle back around was excruciating. And then I'd see people at my table sipping on their glass and I'd think, man, are you going to finish that? I mean, if they had left the table, I would have totally finished it. That is not regular behavior. And it's okay, guys. This is not a reflection on who we are as people. This is the drug. Justifying your drinking because it's top shelf or you do it at upscale events. I was on a wine tour, I have to drink, or this is a rare bottle from Italy. This is, this is, this. This whiskey was aged, this bourbon, this scotch was aged in this, the process and yada, yada, yada. You know, if you're a successful person, there's a reason that you've been conditioned to think that that is valuable. And we talk about that in our program. But the stuff in, in that aged scotch is the exact same chemical makeup as the stuff that you see the poor souls drinking out of a brown paper bag. It is the same. Your brain and your liver cannot tell the difference between the brown paper bag and the bottle of scotch that cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It doesn't care about the history of the wine, how it was made, how rare it is. And I understand why you use that as justification, because I did too. Lying to yourself and or others about how you are drinking and how drink how strong your drinks are. So a drink is measured by the CDC as one 12 ounce beer, 1.5 ounces of liquor, or one five ounce glass of wine. If you're listening to this, do you take a shot glass and measure out 1.5 ounces and have just that? Maybe two of those? Or are you looking for the bartender with the heavy pour? How about your wine? Have you ever put 5.5 5 ounces in a glass of wine, especially the new ones that are so big? Have you ever seen what that looks like? That's not what I was drinking. I was not interested in a five ounce glass of wine. And certainly if I made myself a mixed drink, no one was seeing how much vodka was going in there. This one, obsessing over when you can attain your next drink. You guys feel, feel that? Mm-hmm. You are at an event and like, how much longer? How long till the waiter comes back around like I described at the gala? Uh, being at an activity for work or for, let's say, a kid's activity. You're at that soccer game. Oh my gosh, it's going into overtime. This is going to interfere. I'm not going to be home for another hour. Yikes. That's not who we are, guys. But that's the power of alcohol. People who don't have an alcohol issue don't think that way. And then this can be one of the trickiest ones. Remaining well-known for doing an exceptional job at work despite your excessive alcohol use, which may or may not be causing problems in other areas of your life. We have members join and they'll say, I had my best year ever last year. How could I have a drinking problem if I had my best year ever? You know the answer. So, hmm, deep breath here. How many 
of those checked a box for you. In the next episode, I'm going to review some of these and I'm going to help you listeners understand why alcohol-free lifestyle and our programs are the solution. What makes us so unique that we resonate with people who check these boxes? Why are we so effective? If you've seen our study conducted with the University of Washington, we took 160 plus members through our methodology for 90 days, resulted in a 98% reduction in their drinking. Unheard of, but documented now through science. That's powerful stuff. Does that pique your curiosity? I hope so. So listen in for the next episode. I invite you to rejoin me. And again, take a deep breath. Recognize that this is alcohol doing what it's designed to do. If you're listening to this podcast, you are not the person that alcohol is telling you you are. There is something far better on the, uh, on the other side. And it starts possibly with us. Until next time, thanks for listening. Take good care. And I'll see you on the next episode.